up at Grace Bible Church. I'm glad all of you are here this morning gathering with us on this holiday weekend. We're looking a little skinny, but that's okay on a holiday weekend, isn't it? Uh, my name is Kathy Arocco, and I'm the Director of Women's Ministry here. If we haven't had a chance to meet, I would love to meet you. I sit right over here in the corner next to my handsome husband, who's waving. Um, it's great to be here this morning. Uh, each week, we gather around the person and work of Jesus Christ, because we believe that Jesus is the answer, has the answer for every question that life throws at us. So whether you are curious about Jesus or committed to following him, he calls each and every one of us to come to him in worship. And we hear that call to worship in Psalm 67. May God be gracious to us and bless us. May he make his face shine upon us so that your way may be known on earth, your salvation among the nations. Let the peoples praise you, God. Let all the peoples praise you. Amen, amen. All right, well, let's stand together to sing. I'm excited this morning because I brought my best friend to sing with me, so ha-ha, <laughs> tricked her into it again. So let's sing to our God. This first song is called Jesus Fount of Joy, and um, I was just thinking, we sing a lot of songs that maybe are not like a super well-known to everybody, but this song, actually, one of my, my good friends helped to write, and so that's sometimes why we sing these songs that you may not be as familiar with because there's all these cool songs that people are are bringing before the, our God, and it's just an exciting thing to get to sing them together. Uh, the Psalms tell us to sing a new song to our God. So uh, if you don't know it yet, just hang on for the ride. You'll get the hang of it. Um, but it's just a beautiful truth that God is the source of our joy. So let's sing this out. Found joy eternal, spring of endless love divine, deepest well ones poured out for us, filling empty hearts with life. Sing, come, rejoice, be glad forever. Come, rejoice.
So we come to dwell upon the goodness of our God, and one of the things that we are most thankful for is his faithfulness to us. So let's sing these words out together. Sing great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not thy compassions, they fail not. As thou hast been, thou forever will be. Sing summer and winter and springtime and harvest. Take a seat for a moment.
So we believe as a church that um, we're here to gather around the work of Jesus and the person of Jesus. Um, another word for that is the gospel. And we believe the gospel is the story and the good news of how God has sent his son to save us, how we can be saved from our sin um, by his goodness, by his sacrifice. And that's something we don't graduate from, right? That is the thing that, that saves us, but also that continues to sanctify us, to make us more holy. Um, it's the thing that we need to keep following Jesus together. And so we have this pattern of, even as believers, even as those who have confessed our sins have been forgiven, God calls us to continue to confess, to admit that there is good and there is wrong based on his character, um, and that we have, there are ways that we have failed and we need his forgiveness and his help. So we're going to take a moment to bow our heads and close our eyes um, and to confess to our God and ask for his help to treasure him above all things and to follow him more closely. And let's do that together silently. Father, we're people who gather around who you are and what you've done. Help us to be amazed again at the grace that you've shown to us in Jesus. We pray that our love for you will grow so big. We will be so grateful that it pushes out lesser loves. Not only that, but it builds love for each other in our hearts, helps us to serve and to be generous. We thank you for this time to sing. We pray that it will shape our affection and our action. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, I didn't realize we we're going to do kind of two songwriter songs today, but it, this is a song called Rest. And... Uh, we actually, if you haven't heard the story before, I'll just do the 10 second version. But um, at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, we were having a women's retreat and we had to do it online. Um, and so uh, we were actually, Brooke and I we were trying to figure out, man, let's write, try to write a song uh, that captures what rest means. Um, and we found ourselves in this strange place of, well, gosh, this is the most unrestful we've probably ever felt. You know, if you remember how we didn't know what was going on, we didn't know what to do. We were all kind of at home and um, never done this thing before, right? Um, and so we were reading through uh, the Psalms, and the famous Psalm talks about, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Um, he, he leads me to green pastures, he leads me beside still waters. And again, we were like, I think, <laughs> had this feeling of like, this does not feel like green pastures, this does not feel like quiet waters. Um, but this is the pattern of who God is, so either... He's not doing the thing that he's, that it says in scripture he will do, or maybe he's doing it in a way that we didn't expect. Um, maybe he's providing in a way that we didn't imagine. And so I think as we were trying to wrestle through this song, uh, she wrote all the coolest words, by the way, just, just so you know. But um, we realize he, he is that for us in any situation that God is actually our green pastures, that God is actually our still water. So we can go through any turmoil. We can be in the driest desert and feel like we are fully provided for because of who he is, his character and his love for us. Um, so hopefully that will ring out, especially in this I Heart Clean series, right? You may feel like this is the desert city you've been brought to. Um, and God is enough for you here. Um, that's what we believe as a church. So, um, you can just sing along when you get the hang of this. Um, let's worship our God together. In this valley shadows when I 
I'm cold and afraid. Are you with me? Though I struggle to see God, my shepherd, I will go where you lead. And I will lay down, believing that you've carried me to rest all my doubts in the perfect love cast out all fear you are my greenest pastures you are my quiet ones let's stand together and sing this
Praise God. So just to continue that theme, um, whatever you're feeling, if this is a restful place or if it's not, because of what Jesus has done, we can say that it's well with our souls. Let's sing this out. When peace like a river attended my way, when sorrows like sea billows
Let's praise him for that. Praise God. Woo! God, thank you for giving us voices to sing your praise. God, for those of us that are still wrestling, wondering, are you truly good? We pray that you will show yourself more real, more close to us than ever before. We thank you for giving us your spirit, the comf comforter, the helper. God, help us to abide in you. Let your words abide in us. We pray that you will shape us. We pray that you will give us strength and bravery to love others and to love you well. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Y'all can take a seat. Thank you, Chris and Brooke, for leading us in worship. Well, once again, I just want to say my name is Kathy Arocco, and if we had, haven't had a chance to meet, I would love to meet you after the service. If you are new here today, we would love it if you would grab one of those blue Connect cards on the bench in front of you and fill that out. Uh, that just allows us to follow up with you. We can answer any questions that you have. It means we will connect with you either by phone call or email. I'm not sure how they're doing it these days. But we can answer questions, and you can find out a little bit more about GBC. So fill that out, and you can turn it in. Everybody's okay up here. I can see. Um, you can turn it into the offering boxes that are um, on the wall, affixed to the wall in the back, or there's also one out across from the coffee bar. And make sure when you leave the sanctuary to grab one of our free GBC mugs. Those are just a way to say thank you for visiting. We are super glad that you're here. At Grace Bible Church, there are three ways that we seek to follow Jesus. That's what we're about. That's our goal. That's our, like, corporate identity. And so these are ways that, as a corporate body, we can um, come together to follow Jesus. Gather, serve, and join. Gather and worship. We have um, services online. If you're ever out of, t out of town, you can grab that at 9 o'clock on YouTube or Facebook. And we also have our 11 o'clock service. Um, but it's just a great opportunity to worship together, to um, come together, pray for one another, and to hear the word preached. Uh, secondly, serve on a team. There are lots of different uh, teams that you can serve on. And I just encourage you to really be thinking about that, especially during this season as we live in a military town and there's lots of transition. And so people are leaving, moving away, who have been um, coming alongside and serving. And so we can always use extra hands. So it's a great way to strengthen your faith. It's a great way to deepen relationships and just serve the body of Christ here at Grace Bible Church. Uh, the third way is to join a group. Again, some of these may be in transition because we live in a transitional uh, community, but um, it's an, an opportunity to gather with like-minded believers to pray for one another, be in the Word together, read Scripture together, and just grow in your relationship with Jesus Christ. So if you have questions about any of those three steps, please contact the office at begrace.org, and they can answer any questions that you have and get you pointed in the right direction. Coming up, uh, GBC is beginning a trauma care group that will be meeting Tuesday evenings in the back building beginning at 7 o'clock. And this will be a Christ-centered care group that's focused on breaking cycles of family dysfunction and seeking to live our lives according to the glory of God. And so this is for veterans and first responders. It's open to the public, so you can invite friends and family. And if you have uh, any questions or want more details, please contact office at begrace.org, and they can fill you in with all the extra information that you need. Also, coming up really soon, ladies, this is for you. Um, I'm the women's ministry director, so if you have any questions about this, come and talk to me. Um, we, our summer study is getting ready to kick off uh, June 16th. We meet here in the sanctuary at Grace Bible Church. We are going to be looking at soul songs because in our culture, in our world, we hear many different voices, and it tells us different things. And so we are going to be looking to retune our hearts to God. We're going to be using the ancient hymnal called the Book of Psalms to be looking at different things like love and guilt and sin and temptation. So please join us. Uh, there will be free child care. We are working really hard to get an elementary school program. So if you have elementary kids and you're thinking, oh, 
man, I can't come. Yes, you can. We will have that for you. So please go to the website, uh, begrace.org backslash women and sign up for that so we can make plans for you. Also coming up in June, men's breakfast, 7 a.m. It's always early, but it's, I hear it's always good. So they meet in the back building. Uh, you can contact Jim. This month they will be focusing on leadership. Okay, so whether we like it or not, each and every one of us in our spheres of influence, um, we lead in some way or the other. And so we're, th- the men will be looking at uh, how Jesus is the ultimate leader, and it looks like serving and hum- humility and, and just loving one another. So um, contact Jim if you have questions about that, uh, looking at servant leadership on Saturday, June 11th. Also, coming up really soon, June 9th, ladies, our next coffee hangout. We are going to be meeting in Temple at Fire Street Roasters. Great time to make new friends, great time to connect with current friends and just deepen relationships. There is a small play area for your kids, so bring your kids, order an iced coffee because it's probably going to be hot because we are in Texas in the summer months, but would love to see you there. All right, now I'm going to turn this over to Steve because he's, he hearts Colleen, and he's going to tell us how we can heart Colleen more with the youth, right? That's right. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Kathy. So it, as we've been getting closer and closer to impact camp and Bible clubs, um, we, we're one week away from our teenagers leaving off to camp. We're two weeks away from impact Bible clubs here in our city. As we've been closer and closer, um, I've been marveling at this passage where Jesus is interacting with children and his disciples. Marvel with me for just a moment. Then little children were brought to Jesus for him to place his hands on them and pray. But the disciples rebuked them. Jesus said, leave the little children alone and don't try to keep them from coming to me. Because the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. After placing his hands on them, he went on from there. Truly I tell you, he said, Unless you turn and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself like this child, this one is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever welcomes one child like this in my name welcomes me. So if you're like me, uh, when you read that passage, it didn't play out the way you expected it to. If you're like me, uh, you expected Jesus to send the kids away too. Your ears aren't quite mature enough to hear this good news that I have for you. Come back later when you have more understanding, when you have more wisdom, when you know a little bit more. When you're older and wiser, come back, and and I'll tell you about it then, right? But that's not what Jesus said. I expected him to tell uh, the kids that they needed to be more like grown-ups, but he sent uh, the grown-ups away and welcomed the children. He told the grown-ups that they needed to become more like children, He doesn't tell the little children that their lack of knowledge is a barrier between them and him, but he tells the adults that their pride is. There's something really beautiful about that. There's something beautiful about a child's humble, dependent, childlike faith, and God tells us that we need that if we're going to see Jesus in heaven. How many of you, let's just pull the room real quick, how many of you came to follow Jesus when you were a child? Raise your hands. Look around, guys. That's half of the room. That's incredible. God gives eternal life to children. I took a spoon away from my son the other day because I thought he was going to hurt himself with it. (laughs) God gives eternal life to children. That blows me away. We are two weeks away um, from Impact Bible Clubs where our teenagers are going to go out and they're going to share Jesus' good news with kids in backyards and splash pads and parks and at a daycare Um, all over town, you can be a part of the eternal things that God is doing here too. If you have the ability to, and you can commit long term, when we finish Impact, some of the kids that we meet out there are going to come here. And we need volunteers who can volunteer one time a month to serve in our nursery and in our children's church. When we finish Impact, um, if you can't commit to anything long term right now, but you want to help us, we need things we need drivers. We're still short for, uh, for drivers who can take us to and from clubs. We need meal cookers. I think we're four meals shy. We have about 25 hungry teenagers, about 30 total. And all right, I see hands. This is great. We're moving forward here. 
We need meal cookers, and we need some more snacks. We're still short on that. And we need all of you, Grace Bible Church, to help us invite children to our clubs. We have really cool little cards with QR codes on them, and you can just hand them to anyone who has a kid. So hopefully you now have some friends and family, you have some neighbors, you have some coworkers who have little kids, give them the card and explain to them what uh, Impact Bible Clubs are. We would love to see them there. And last but not least, we need you to join us in prayer. Uh, if I'm honest with you guys, this has kind of snuck up on me, and I have a tendency to be more uh, 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 trying to figure out what we need to do next rather than be prayerful. So I would love it if you would join uh, with me in praying for our clubs. Thank you so much, Grace Bible Church. We couldn't do it without you. Uh, thanks for supporting us in Impact this year. Thanks, man. Well, Steve preached half my sermon already, so I'm in trouble. Y'all are in trouble. All the little children come and all that. That's in here, so you have to hear it twice, I guess, huh? Well, my name's Joey. I'm one of the pastors here. Sorry, let me get organized. And I am so excited and happy to be with you today sharing. Uh, we're going to be looking at the book of Jonah today. So if you want to turn in your Bibles to the book of Jonah, we'll be looking at that text today. If you're borrowing one of our Bibles, uh, there's some Bibles in the pew in front of you. If you don't have one, if you didn't bring your own, and it's on page 775, 775. Well, this weekend is a holiday weekend, which Kathy recognized that we might be looking a little skinnier. I might not be, but we might be as a whole. Um, it, it's also been a hard couple weeks. Um, the news, you've seen probably that there's been tragedies and, and hard times, and this this. Uh, world we live in has been tough. It's been a bad place, right? It's a place that's not our home, but we're called to it, right? And that's the series we're talking about, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But I just wanted to recognize that this holiday weekend, uh, Memorial Day, we're going to honor the sacrifice of those uh, who've given their lives, but it, it's, it's been weird. But more than ever, we need to, um, we need to be encouraged by the gospel. So we're going to look at the good news today and be encouraged by it. So would you be encouraged by the good news of the gospel together with me during this hard time, during this place that's not our home. Like I said, my name's Joey. I am one of the pastors here, but I'm not the pastor you usually see up here. Dave is usually a pastor you see up here, but he is out of town this week, but he's not far out of town. He is just down the street in Copper's Cove at one of our church plants uh, called Watershed Church. So if you live out in Copper's Cove and you think that Grace Bible Church is the only good church in town, I want to encourage you to go check out Watershed Church. It's a lot closer to you, and they are an awesome church full of people who love Jesus and love their city well, too. You'll also notice today that there are more kids in here than usual. I, that's in my notes, but really, I don't think that's actually true for first service. First service, we're probably about the same, but if you need the encouragement and the reminder, uh, here it is. Your kids are not a distraction to other people. Your kids are part of the church. We want them in here, and we want them to be doing church together with us. With us, We're taking a three-week break because of impact, because of what Steve talked about. If impact is a huge um, lift for our church, for our youth ministry, and so we give uh, all of our volunteers a few weeks of a break, and we tell you to bring all the kids in here with us. We kind of force you to do it, but they're part of the church, so if you feel like you need to step out with your kids, feel free to do that. If you feel like you want to stay, feel free to do that. If you need to grab coloring sheets, there's coloring sheets in the back. But your kids are not a distraction to anyone, maybe uh, only yourself. Huh? My kids mostly just make me feel stressed and anxious. Um, but we're continuing our I Heart Colleen series today. It's a series about how the gospel charges us and challenges us to love our city. So we've been looking at different scriptures each week. That's not usually uh, how we study the Bible here together. Usually, we pick a book or, or a series, and we go through that book uh, in order. We follow the text. And we are still going to do that in how we read the Bible today and how we study God's Word today. But we're in a small little series where we're kind of jumping between different patches, passages to look at different things. Well, today, as we look at how the gospel challenges us to love our city, to, uh, like the t-shirt says, to heart Colleen, 
Uh, we're going to be looking at sharing the good news today. Um, and we'll see from the story of Jonah that sometimes we share the good news willingly, and sometimes we do it by the scruff of our neck, right? God's got to grab us and drag us along to do it. Um, so as you turn your Bibles to Jonah, I want to tell you a little story about my um, coming to Colleen, right? So my obligatory military PCS story, right? How'd you get here? The military, right? That was the story for most everyone until the last couple of years, actually. Um, choosing duty stations, you know, we got to put in our list, our order of what we wanted. And would you guess where Fort Hood was, where Colleen, Texas was on my list? I bet you won't. It was number one on my list, actually. Fort Hood, Texas was my first choice when I was shooting du choosing duty stations. Somebody's walking out already because I said that, huh? <laughs> um, <laughs> no, but it really was uh, probably not for the reasons that are any good or worth it. I had friends who were already stationed here. I had friends who were in the 3rd then Armored Cavalry Regiment, and I wanted to be in that unit. I wanted to be part of that history. Uh, I was excited, so I actually made a little bit of idol out of Colleen in a good way, and most people probably would say they make an anti-idol, I guess, of Colleen and don't want to come here and fight it uh, tooth and nail, and God drags them here by the scruff of their neck. But, you know, some of us come here willingly, and that's actually happening more and more. I don't know if you've noticed, but uh, I've met several people recently who actually are choosing Colleen, would you believe it, uh, who look at either where they're coming from and the ideologies that are there, and they just want to get away from it and come to a more, I think Colleen's probably more neutral than most places. Um, maybe you saw the cost of living and you decided to move here um, because it would be cheaper. You could um, maybe sell your property somewhere else and come here, and maybe you could do better off. But whatever the reason that you came to Colleen, whether you willingly chose to come here like me or whether you were drug here, by the scruff of your neck, and you, you, um, you begged your branch manager to send you somewhere else, um, God called you here. That's what the series is about, right? God called you here, he sent you to Colleen, and it's therefore your job to love Colleen. It's part of the great commission that you've been given, and that's what we'll talk about today, is sharing the good news with Colleen. And we're going to look at one of, I guess, the uh, I wouldn't call him an anti-prophet, but I almost did, so you'll get that, that uh, for you. But Jonah was a prophet, and he just didn't quite get it. We'll, we'll remember VeggieTales in a minute, but he just didn't quite get it. We get a story of a failed prophet, a prophet who didn't do it right. We get a story of an example not to follow, right? Um, I want to read you a quote from J. Max Stiles' book on evangelism. It looks like this, if you want to grab it. I'll show it to you again later. It's a small book. You can all read it. But it's about how the whole church speaks of Jesus. And I want to tell you what he says. He says that we're all ambassadors, right? And the job of an ambassador is to share somebody else's news, to share somebody else's um, vision and mission. So he says that as an ambassador, it's your responsibility to share the message of the one who sends you. So then he goes on to say, we must deliver the message regardless of the discomfort provided, the effort required, and the shame endured. Ambassadors exist to deliver messages. And so we, as ambassadors, he goes on to say, shout out that, I lost my place, sorry. Shout out, be reconciled to God. We may not feel like representatives of the kingdom of God, but if you claim to be a Christ follower, that is what you are. It's how we're seen in the spiritual realms, and it's an astounding truth and says, but of course, we can be good or we can be bad ambassadors. And that good and bad phrase or great and bad phrase we'll see a lot in this story of Jonah. It's kind of a repetitive thing to catch us and make us remember what's going on in the story. Jonah is one of the most important stories in the Bible, and we all know the story. Almost everybody knows the story, whether you've come to church your whole life or not. Kids, do you know the story of Jonah? What's the story of Jonah? He didn't listen to God. Ooh, you got it. He said, nope, we're not doing it, right? God speaks to Jonah. He tells him, go to Nineveh. Call out against Nineveh, right? Because of its evil ways. And what does Jonah do? He goes the opposite direction. He runs away. God told him, walk to Nineveh. It's that way. And he went and got on a boat and went that way, right? Completely opposite. 
of way of what God tells him to do. He gets on a boat in the wrong direction in order to avoid sharing the gospel with the Ninevites, avoiding, in order to avoid sharing the good news with them. But by God's providential deliverance, Jonah ends up in the belly of a whale, in the belly of a big fish, the text says, and goes to Nineveh by divine transportation, right? God saves the Ninevites, and funny, Ninevites, there were about 120,000 of them, we read in the text, and all their animals. You know how big Kalin is? About 150,000. We're pretty close size. So that great city of Nineveh is a lot like this great place, right? Um, so the story comes to an interesting end, though. So I want to take a look at how it ends. So if you're able, would you stand with me in reverence and honor for the reading of God's word from the book of Jonah? I'm going to read to us chapter 4. We're going to start with the end of the story. This is the word of the Lord from the book of Jonah, beginning in chapter 4. It says, But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was angry that God forgave the Ninevites. And he prayed to the Lord and said, O oh Lord, is not this what I said when I was yet in my own country? That is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish. For I knew that you are a gracious God and that you are merciful. You're slow to anger and you're abounding in steadfast love. And relenting from disaster. Therefore now, O Lord, please take my life from me. For it is better for me to die, to die than to live. And the Lord said, Do you do well to be angry? And Jonah went out of the city and sat to the east of the city and made a booth for himself there. He sat under it in the shade till he should see, uh, till he should see what would become of the city. Now the Lord God appointed a plant and made it to come up over Jonah that it might be a shade over his head to save him from his discomfort. So Jonah was exceedingly glad because of the plant. <laughs> but when dawn came up the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the plant so that it would wither, so that it withered. When the sun rose, God appointed a scorching east wind, and the sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was faint. And he asked that he might die and said, It is better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, do you do well to be angry for the plant? And he said, yes, I do well to be angry, angry enough to die. And the Lord said, you pity the plant for which you did not labor, nor did you make it grow, which came into being in a night and perished in a night. And should not I pity Nineveh, the great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left and also much cattle. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you that you care about your cities, that you don't just look on us and see our evil ways and turn your face from us, but that you're a God who descended, a God who came to us in our misery and our distress. We ask that you, you would help us to follow your call to follow your commission that you've given to us to go on our way and to share the good news with others. We ask that you'd help us to do that well and that in doing so we would love our city well and in our loving of them that they would see you and turn their hearts to you, that they would repent and turn towards you. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. I heart Colleen. I don't just say it. I don't just wear the t-shirt. It's not a joke. If it's your first time here today, we really mean it. We love Colleen. Why do we love it? Like I said before, it's because God called us here. That's why we love Colleen, because God loves it here, because God loves Colleen. It might be hard sometimes, right? But we love Colleen, and we don't just pretend to do it. I was wearing my shirt. The other day I went to lunch with Steve, he was here, at Rudy's, and I was wearing one of my I Heart Colleen shirts, and I had a young man come to me and say, do you really love Colleen? I said, I really do, man. Do you love Colleen? And he put a smile on his face, and he said, I do, I really love Colleen. And I was so excited, because that has not happened before, uh, that somebody sees my shirt and thinks, I really love Colleen. And then he went behind the counter, and I heard him talking to his friend, and he said, I hate this place. <laughs> he did. He lied to my face. I got so excited that he loved Colleen. And so I asked him, I said, did you grow up here? 
So yeah, I grew up here. I was like, okay. So if you could go anywhere in the world, where would you want to go? Where, where's better? And he said, I want to live in Austin. I said, <laughs> wow, of all the places in the world you can go to get away from Colleen, you chose Austin, right? But it's that idolatry of place like we were talking about, right? Sometimes we think that that's a better place. Or sometimes we think my next duty station will be a better place, right? But God called you here and now to love Colleen. So do it well. And how do you do it well? By sharing the good news. That's God's call to you as a Christ follower, where he places you to love it well by sharing the good news with it. So today we're going to look again at Jonah and see that we can heart Colleen, sometimes willingly and sometimes by the scruff of our neck. We're going to share the gospel with Colleen. And in the famous words of that cucumber poet... Jonah was a prophet, but he really never got it, right? And so today we're going to look at running. We're going to see um, that like Jonah, we can sometimes run, sometimes literally, sometimes by our thoughts, by our actions, from God's call on us to love the great place that he's divinely placed us in, and we can neglect to share the good news with her. We're going to talk about repenting, that we must repent of our wrong thinking our wrong speaking, our wrong doing, right? That's our impact phrase, think, say, and do. That's what sin is. Sin is anything we think, say, or do that displeases God. And we're going to repent of that and repent of our lack of sharing the good news with the city. We're going to look at that. And we're going to look at redemption, at redeeming, uh, how we can trust a God who's faithful and just to forgive us, who's kind and full of mercy a God who saves us and who saves his city, right? So let's look at the book of Jonah, chapter 1. Let's turn back. We saw the end already, and I gave you the end because the original reader would have heard the ending in the language, in the phrasing. They would have heard the good and the bad right away and known the ending worked out that way. So I gave it to you first, but let's look back at chapter 1. So Jonah, chapter 1 says, Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Imitai saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before him, before me. But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. But the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so that the ship threatened to break up. Then the mariners were afraid, and each cried out to his God. And they hurled the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. But Jonah had gone down into the inner part of the ship and had lain down and was fast asleep. So the captain came and said to him, What do you mean, you sleeper? Arise, call out to your God. Perhaps the God will give a thought to us that we may not perish. And they said to one another, Come, let us cast lots that we may know on whose account this evil has come upon us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. Then they said to him, Tell us on whose account this evil has come upon us. What is your occupation? Where do you come from? What is your country? And of what people are you? And he said to them, I am a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven who made the sea and the dry land. Then the men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, What is it that you have done? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. Then they said to him, What shall we do to you that the sea may quiet down for us? For the sea grew more and more tempestuous. He said to them, Pick me up and hurl me into the sea. Then the sea will quiet down for you. For I know it's because of me that this great tempest has come upon you. Nevertheless, the men rowed hard to get back to dry land, but they could not. For the sea grew more and more tempestuous against them. Therefore, they called out to the Lord, O Lord, let us not perish for this man's life, and lay not on us the innocent blood for you, O Lord, have done as it pleased you. So they picked up Jonah and hurled him into the sea, and the sea ceased from its raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. And the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. If Jonah wouldn't go to the great city, he was going to go to the great storm. And as we look at sin, we often see that sin 
has a storm attached to it. Jonah needed mercy. His need for mercy was real. And he had to call out to God for that. But what did he want to do to the Ninevites? Deny it to them. He ran. His pride, did you see how he answered the questions that they asked him? They asked him, whose account is this evil? What's your occupation? Where do you come from? What's your country? And of what people are you? And what's the answer first? I am a Hebrew. I'm a man of God. I fear God. Right? That falls a little shallow based on his response. Right? I follow God, but I'm running from him. His pride kept him from loving the Ninevites, and his identity was so wrapped up in his people group being a Hebrew that he didn't even want to talk to the others, to the enemies. He wanted to run away from them. He didn't want to see them saved by God because he knew God would save them, that God would follow his character. And so Jonah wanted God to act to him like God acts, but not act to others. So in order to avoid seeing it, he ran. Well, where is our identity? How do we see ourselves? How do we see others? Is Colleen not a good enough place for you, right? You're too good for Colleen? Do you not want to see those wicked pagans see Jesus, right? These Colleen pagans see Jesus? Well, what does God do in response to Jonah's running? He hurls a great wind at him. He makes sailors, seasoned mariners, afraid, right? These men would have went through a lot of storms, and God hurls such a great wind at them that it causes them to fear. And what happens? They hurl cargo into the sea to try and lighten the ship, and then eventually they hurl Jonah into the ship too by his own request. Why? Because Jonah's gone into this deep pit of depression as he's running from God, right? The storm is happening, and where does he go? Into the hole, into the depths of the deep of the ship. And he just sleeps. because He's running and hiding from God. You know who slept on a ship too, though? Someone else, right? Yeah, Jesus. Who said that? Jesus slept on a ship in the middle of a storm too. But was his sleep a sleep of deep sorrow? No, it was a deep of trusting in God, knowing that he controlled the waves, that he was in charge of everything. Well, Jonah isn't Jesus, and he didn't get it right, but we'll get to Jesus later, right? And God restrains from giving Jonah all he deserves, right? What does Jonah ask of them? He says, throw me in the sea, it'll stop. Was he saying, I trust my God to save me? No, he was saying what he says at the end of the chapter. That's why we read chapter four in the end of the book. That's why we read chapter four first. Jonah's saying, throw me over the board so that I can, overboard so I can die. Kill me. I don't need this anymore. I'm running from God. It's horrible. I'm done with it. Throw me overboard. Have you been there? Mm. God doesn't give Jonah all he deserves, but he gives him what he asked for. You want to run from me? Fine. Go. Go to the depth of the ship. Go to the depth of the ocean. Be in the depths of that welly, of that welly, that fish. I don't know what a welly is, but he was in one of them. Um, it, it seems noble, his response, but really, I don't think he was even trusting God. He'd rather die than follow what God called him to do, to go to the Ninevites. You know who called out to God before Jonah did? Those pagan sailors, though, right? The men feared the Lord exceedingly. They offered a sacrifice to the Lord. They made vows. And you might be thinking, sure, it's just a foxhole conversion, though, right? They were in the middle of a storm. It was crazy. And so they called out to God. But what does the text say? They call out to God after the storm ends. They make sacrifices after it ends. They picked up Jonah, hurled him into the sea, and it ceases from raging. And then they fear the Lord. They saw that Jonah was running from a God who was powerful and a God who could save. So they offered sacrifice to the Lord. We see our next point, repentance. We see it before Jonah even gets to it, before Nineveh even gets to it. And these sailors, they call out before Jonah even does. So maybe you've run from Colleen. Maybe you've said, I physically don't want to go here. I'm going to do everything I possibly can to not. Or you've emotionally said, I'm just not going to love Colleen. I can't do it, won't do it. I'm going to worry about myself, my friends. We're not doing... Or maybe um, I've lost my place, but I've got awesome memes about Colleen. That's where we're at. So 
I want you to know that I've seen him. I love him. But man, they're just not quite right. Here's the best one. Dad, what's that shadowy place over there? That's Colleen, Simba. Never go there. You want to know the first time I saw that? I was at a Temple Bible Church when I saw that meme for the first time. And I thought, this is what they think of us. Huh? Never go over there. Well, it's a lie that we tell ourselves that God will withhold, ultimately, our joy from us, right? That if we were in a better place, that's where we could have real joy. That's where God will really love us. Well, I have something for adults and for you kids, okay? For the adults, Jonah's serving of God, of Yahweh. Man, it rings so hollow when he's talking, right? So are your words not really matching with your actions, with your thoughts, Are you telling people I love Jesus, but then not really loving the city, not really sharing sharing the gospel with him? Jonah in verse 9, you know how he identifies? Race first. I'm a Hebrew. That's who I am, and God loves Hebrews. Man. He puts his identity and his racial background before his identity in God. He answers the questions he's given in reverse. That's how we can see how important it is to him. They asked him, what God do you serve? He said, I'm a Hebrew. Do your responses ring like that? Is your identity placed in God? Are you acting like it? Would other people know that? Do your actions match that? Do your words match that? How have you been running from this city, from Colleen? Have you run physically or maybe even by inaction? By just not doing anything? Shutting off emotionally, not connecting with people, not loving people well. What's God called you to here? He's called you clean. You're here. You've been called here. We talked about that this last several weeks. And if you're here, he's called you to share the gospel here. It's the Great Commission. The Great Commission says, go and make disciples. Really, if you look at the language, translate it, the word is actually going. So in your doing, in your going, you don't need to be sent somewhere else to go share the good news. In your going, share the good news. Are you doing that here where God has called you? Are you loving your neighbors well? Are you sharing the good news with them? Are you loving your workplace well? Are you sharing the good news with them? What places do you go frequently? How can you share the good news with them? Kids, who are you called to? Who do you share the good news with? Is it your family? Maybe your family, your brothers and sisters? God, maybe. Maybe you need to talk to God about it. We'll talk about that in a second, huh? Maybe it's your friends or your teammates or your classmates. Are you running by being afraid of maybe what your friends would say to you? Well, Jonah ran, and we get the example in Scripture of to not do what Jonah did, right? That's the big point of Jonah. One of them is to not do what Jonah did. Don't be like Jonah. Well, repentance. We talked about the repentance of the sailors. This is coming from chapter 2 all the way through chapter 3, verse 9. So I'm going to read that to you. We saw a little bit of repentance, a hint of it, in the pagan sailors, in the non-Hebrew sailors. We haven't seen anything from Jonah yet. We haven't seen him complete his mission. So let's look at chapter 2. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the belly of the fish, saying, I called out to the Lord out of my distress, and he answered me. Out of the belly of Sheol I cried, and you heard my voice. For you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the flood surrounded me. All your waves and your billows passed over me. Then I said, I am driven away from your sight, yet I shall again look upon your holy temple." The waters closed in over me to take my life. The deep surrounded me. Weeds were wrapped about my head. At the roots of the mountains, I went down to the land whose bars closed upon me forever. Yet you brought up my life from the pit, O Lord, my God. When my life was fainting away, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came to you into your holy temple. Those who pay regard to vain idols forsake their hope of steadfast love. But I, with the voice of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you what I vowed I will pay. Salvation belongs to the Lord. And the Lord spoke to the fish, and it vomited Jonah out upon the dry land. I'm going to pause there for a second. But we see this prayer of Jonah's, right? But is it a prayer of repentance? 
we don't really get to see his repentance. This is actually a prayer of thanksgiving. So somehow in here, the repentance already happened, and I bet you I know where it happened. Let me see. I called out to the Lord out of my distress, and he answered me out of the valley of Sheol. I cried. You cast me into the deep. The flood surrounded me. Your waves and billows passed over me. He was driven away from his sight. The waters closed in over me. Where did he call out to God? The deepest of the deeps. That's, that's got to be where the repentance happens, right? How can you thank God for saving you and for the repentance if it didn't happen, right? So the repentance happens somewhere in there, and I'm going to skip ahead to my illustration and come back to my other stuff because I want to talk about a near-drowning experience. Anyone ever had a near-drowning experience? Only one, two, maybe, three. I want to tell you about one that happened just the other day. It's awesome. We have been, it's summer now, Texas is hot, and we've been swimming a little bit more than we have lately. And I want to be clear right off the bat, this was in no way actually like a really near, near drowning experience, but one of my sons has gotten a little big for his britches, or should I say swim trunks, and he has decided that he can jump into pools without a flotation device sometimes. He forgets, he tells me, um, that he can't quite swim yet. And man, we were swimming yesterday, and he just, I was holding the other son, and he got off, and I heard splashing and looked over, and you know what he was doing? He was reaching out and calling. That picture almost looks like they're swimming, but I'm using it for drowning, okay? He was reaching out. I heard the splashing. He was calling out because he needed to be pulled up. He needed to be saved. He couldn't do it on his own, just like we can't do it on our own. And at a basic level, when we're talking about repenting, when we're talking about repentance, that's what we're talking about. We're talking about calling out to God in our distress. But repentance is also turning, and we'll see that in a second. It's turning from our sins. It's turning from our disobedience. You know, Jonah's fish, I think I've often looked at it as a punishment, right? Being in the fish for three days and three nights. But it was actually a salvation. It wasn't a punishment. Jonah is grabbed and saved and secured by God from the depths by a fish. And then he's, like I said earlier, divinely transported to where he's supposed to go, right? Let's continue on uh, chapter 3. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and call out against it the message that I tell you. Do you think he's going to listen the second time? So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, three days' journey in breadth. It was a big place. It took him three days to walk all the way across it. And Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's journey. And he called out, yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Shortest sermon, one of the shortest sermons. Five words in the original language. Yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. That's the sermon they got. And the people of Nineveh believed God. They called for a fast and they put on sackcloth from the greatest of them to the least of them. The people repented. And then the word of the repentance reached the king of Nineveh and he arose from his throne, removed his robe, covered himself with sackcloth and sat in ashes. And he issued a proclamation and published through Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed or drink water, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth, and let them call out mightily to God. Let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands. Who knows? God may turn and relent and turn from his fierce anger so that we may not perish. The Ninevites, the pagans, they did what Jonah knew what they would do. They repented. And God's going to do what Jonah knew he was going to do. He is going to forgive them. He's going to redeem them. And Jonah's about to be angry about it. But this true repentance that we actually get to see from the Ninevites is a repentance that turns from its evil ways. They heard what God was going to do, they feared the Lord, and they immediately turned from their evil ways. And it wasn't just because of that king's decree, because what happens first? The people hear the message and repent. Jonah gets halfway through his journey before people repent. He didn't even get to finish it. 
He began his journey. Didn't even get to finish sharing the good news with them, telling them to repent before the people heard it, feared God, and repented. The people did what Jonah knew they would do, and God's going to do what Jonah knew he was going to do. I, I find it a little interesting, about that little section on the animals and the cattle uh, being put in a sackcloth cloth and having to repent as well. But we see even in the creation narrative that sin affects everything. It affects the whole world. And if you need more proof of sin's effect on all of creation, you can look at the poison ivy on my arms and the smell of calamine lotion on my arms. It's bad. If you want to come look in my backyard at all the wasps back there and my poor daughter's sadness every time I have to exterminate one. She says, aren't they God's creation, right? But sin affects all of creation. Well, I want you to look at Jonah's story. I want you to look at the Ninevites and see repentance. I want you to look and repent of your running. Where have you run from God, from what he's told you to do, from sharing the good news? Because the kingdom of heaven is at hand. You need to call out to God, reach out to him, and then you need to turn from your evil ways. Stop running. If you need to talk to somebody about that, at the end of the service, there's going to be somebody up front to talk to you about that. Please, come up. If you don't know this Jesus and don't know why you would repent, you don't know this God, come talk to somebody. Let's talk about it. Pray to the creator of the universe. Why? Because he cares for you. And kids, and really adults, kids, but don't tell them, okay? We can pretend it's a kid problem. You might just think, Jonah's prayer was so beautiful. It's so wonderful. I can't pray like that. You know what God told us? Mr. Steve told you earlier too, right? Come like a child. Speak to me like you're talking to daddy, right? Don't bring me your beating of your chest in the city square, right? Bring me your humble prayers. Have faith like a child. Jesus told us to be like you, kids. And you know what we sing almost every night with Samuel when we go to bed? That we can always run to Jesus because Jesus is strong and kind. And if you're still struggling and you don't know what to do, I have a couple books for you about prayer. Except I'm missing a bunch of them from my office. So if any of you borrowed my books on prayer, you bring them back. Uh, one of them is The Valley of Vision. I love this book. This book is a book of Puritan prayers. Um, if you haven't read it before, it's kind of got prayers for every situation. Uh, and if you don't know the words to pray, you can pull one up and say, man, I want to look at this prayer. This is another book that's kind of like that. It's called A Guidebook uh, for Prayer in Corporate Worship, for public prayer, public praying in corporate worship. This is one of those books where it's like they put the title on there really funky. It's not the best. But that's by Pat Quinn. You can find that book. It has um, some, some prayers in the back. Uh, that you can pray. And then the one I really want to show you that I couldn't find is Every Moment Holy. We talk about it all the time. It's a big, thick book about this big. It's about this color. It's got gold writing. Yes, you got it. Hold it up. Show everybody. Oh, you're going to make me hold it up? This is the small version of it. Mine's a little bigger, but Every Moment Holy. It was in the purse because we got to capture every moment. You don't know what to pray? Um, find words to pray. Pray scripture. Jonah's prayer is chock full of scripture, right? It's full of psalms. It's full of hints from Scripture. So if you don't know what to pray, there are options for praying. I'm going to blame the time for Steve, right? I'm at 37 minutes. It's Steve's fault. All right. Uh, let me read Jonah uh, chapter 3, verse 10 through the end one more time for you as we move towards wrapping up. When God saw what they did, how they turned from the evil ways, God relented of the disaster that he had said he would do to them, and he did not do it. And we already read all of chapter 4, so I'll remind you that Jonah gets pretty upset about God saving the Ninevites. And that's probably the biggest issue uh, that Jonah wrestles with throughout the book. It's the character of God, what God will do, how God will act in his character, God's compassion, his grace, his love. Jonah's pleased with the positive characteristics when they affect him. But when they're going to affect his enemies, the other people when they're going to save pagan sailors, when they're going to save a wicked city, Jonah becomes furious and angry. Don't be like Jonah. Jonah sees the literal idols of his enemies, but he doesn't see the ones that are right inside of his own heart. It, this book, the book of Jonah, highlights 
this double standard. It serves as a challenge to our selfish pettiness, our moralisticness, our religiousness. Jonah praises God for saving him in chapter 2, and he protests God in his compassion. And then he does it again with that plant. God gives him a plant, and he's angry that the plant's gone. More angry, or yeah, he was more happy about that plant than he was about the saving of a whole city. 120,000 people. Don't be like Jonah. That fish wasn't punishment, it was salvation. But real redemption isn't the release from the fish. It's the recognition of sin, the, the repentance, the turning back, the restoration of a relationship between the creator and you, his creation. So God's questions about the reasonableness of his compassion, it's left hanging. We don't get an answer from Jonah. Maybe Jonah got it eventually, but we don't see that. This story is a story, it's a warning, right? Don't be like Jonah. I've said it like 16 times. Don't be like Jonah. It's not clear if he gets it, but you know what is clear? It's that you should get it from this text. That's what's clear here. God asks those questions. Do you do well to be angry? You pitied the plant. We're supposed to get it, even though Jonah didn't get it. So, oh, illustration almost skipped it. Sorry. Chain's broken, man. Coming back to God, repenting and turning to Christ, he will redeem us. He will be faithful and just to forgive us of our unrighteousness. This work is always a work of God. He calls us into that to go share the good news with our city, to share the good news where he planted us. But the work is the Lord's, and when the Lord works, he will break chains. So how do you accept what God's done for you, who he is for you, but neglect to accept that for your enemies, or for your neighbors? Are you being like Jonah? You, as God's servant, can either oppose him, but you won't be able to succeed. You can't expect him to be unfaithful to his own character, He's patient. He's forgiving. He's eager enough. So what are your idols? Don't be like Jonah. Learn from Jonah's error. What are your idols? Recognize them. Have you repented of them? Or are you still running? Repent. The kingdom of God is at hand. Get your heart in step with the Lord's heart. That's the story. The prophet Jonah wasn't in line with God's heart for people. God's heart for the city, for that great place. Is your heart in line with God's heart for this great place? He's called you to this city. He's called you to love this city. Share the good news with it. For the good of this city, for the good of Christ's kingdom, do it willingly and not by the scruff of the neck like Jonah. That's an adult problem again, right kids? Maybe not, huh? Don't follow Jonah's example. And don't follow our example either. Look to Jesus and his example, the better Jonah, right? I have some books on evangelism real quick. I showed you this one already. That's where my quote came from earlier. That's Evangelism by Max Stiles. I have Understanding the Great Commission by Mark Dever. It's a good one about knowing what that calling is, right? You hear the Great Commission all the time. You hear share the good news. Well, what is it? How can you understand it better? Mark Dever wants to tell you. I've got a book called The 3D Gospel, This is a gospel about um, ministry and sharing the good news uh, in guilt, shame, and fear cultures. Three different types of cultures in my experience. In Colleen, we get a lot of people from a lot of different places, different ways to clearly share the gospel with people who understand the world a little bit differently than you do. And then I also have one last book. It's by Ben Connolly and Bob Roberts Jr. It's a field guide for everyday missions. It's 30 days of devotionals with 101 ways to demonstrate the gospel. How you can share the gospel and love the city here, a devotional guide that you can use to help you know how to share the gospel with Colleen just a little bit better. So the book we read, it's a book about Jonah. It's a book about his hatred towards his enemies, but it's also and especially a book about God's compassion, his compassion towards people who are evil and people who are his enemies, people like us. No one should oppose God's mercy in receiving sinners into the kingdom, though. That's not your job. You don't get to decide. You get to do what God told you to do. Don't run 
follow his call. Jonah failed and we fail, but God doesn't fail. In Jesus, the ultimate Jonah. His short little sermon, five Hebrew words translated as 40 days from, Nin- from now, Nineveh will be overthrown. It's not about his message, though, really. It's about his difficulty with the message that he was sent to share. The difficulty with doing what Christ, what God actually told him to do. A difficulty in doing an outcome Jonah already knew it was going to happen. And I, I wanted to come here to Colleen. Not all of you did. But man, are you having difficulty with God's call towards you to love this city, to share the good news with him? Well, I have some good news for you from Veggie Tales. Again, our God is a God of second chances, right? For others, but also for us. So share this good news with others. Share this good news with yourself. The basic message of the whole text is today is don't be like Jonah. Don't not get it. Look at his example. Don't not get it. That's great English. Look at his example and see, see what not to do. And you know what? Impact is coming. Steve told you. How can you help share that good news? Impact is our main thrust of our church on how to love our city by sharing the good news with her. So find out from Steve ways you can help share the good news, even if that means making a meal for our kids so that they can go out and share the good news. God's love penetrating our heart. That's what it does. It penetrates our heart so much so that we can love the city and the people around us. And we best show that love by being good ambassadors and not bad ambassadors, by sharing the good news with Jesus. But if you don't know Jesus, you can't do that. How could you share that good news if you don't know him? So if you want to know more about that good news, if you want to hear more about a God who saves, after the service, there's going to be a couple up here to talk to you. If you need to talk to somebody about repenting, about stopping your running, come talk to them. They'll be up here. Let's pray to the God who saves, the God who descends. Father, we thank you that you're good and that you love us, that you don't leave us in our our misery and our distress, but that you came to us in Jesus. We thank you that by his blood, We can be redeemed, that chains can be broken, that we can turn from our sins and turn back to you. We ask that you would help us to do that, that we would love this city well because you loved us first. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. In response to Christ's love for us, Christ's followers, you're invited to join us in communion. Communion is a time that we set aside to reflect And if you're not a Christ follower, I want to ask you to reflect, to come up front, to walk past and think about what you are trusting in to save you. Look at your heart and see where your idols are. Why are you not loving others well? Why are you not sharing the good news with them? Pass by the communion if that's not you. If you don't love Jesus and you're not past it, come up with us. Walk past it at the end of service. Come up and talk to somebody about it. We have a couple that would love to talk to you about Jesus. They want you to know Jesus. They want to share the good news with you. And on the night when Christ was crucified, he took the bread and he broke it. He said, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup and pouring it, he said, this is my blood, the blood of the new covenant poured out for you. And so as often as you drink and as often as you eat, you do this in remembrance of him. We'll rise now And you could walk clockwise forward out of your left side of your pews. Come forward. You're welcome to take communion up front or to bring it back with you to your seats uh, and return to your chairs.
said it twice, third time's the charm. There's going to be somebody up front if you want somebody to pray with. We'd love to talk to you about who Jesus is, about his love for you, to help you look at what it would be like to run not from God, but from your sin, to turn back to him or to turn to him for the first time. They'll be up front right here as we end. And Christ follower, I want to encourage you uh, by the words of the Great Commission, by the words that Jesus gave his disciples uh, when they saw him after he rose again. He says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. So go, therefore, in your going, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And therefore, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Bible Church, you are dismissed.